Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back. You're watching Women's AM with myself, Liz, and on the panel joining me, we have Hassana, Ayan, and our special guest, Sarah. So, Sarah, I'm intrigued to know, how did you get into fostering in the first place? I mean, I've always wanted to, to do something that I could give back to society, to the community, you know, do something that is fulfilling my Islamic duty as well. Absolutely, it, yeah. Um, my parents were, had been foster cares for at least 15 years, if oh, not more. Wow. So I have kind of been around fostering and that's how I was introduced to it. I mean, with my husband, we talked about this and we decided that this was the right time to do it. So that's how we basically got into it. Oh, lovely. Yeah. And your husband was just as into it as yeah. you were. So that's my husband, nice. Yeah, yeah, really wanted to do from the Islamic point of view. That's why he came from, that, yep, this is what we need to do. No, absolutely. So yeah. needed. I wanted to ask you something. You know, something that often people don't maybe really think about is the whole idea of the whole birth parents. How does that work? I mean, how, did, how, how do you interact with them? How, do you, how does that kind of relationship work? I mean, birth parents are, I mean, some birth parents can be really nice and really great and be very, you know, um, helping you to assist with the child's needs and stuff, where other birth parents are not. But what you need to look at is, um, you know, you can sometimes feel quite upset by what the child has gone through and feeling that, you know, the parents have been partial to it or been, you know, involved in that. And that's quite, you know, quite difficult to understand that how can a parent put their child in that kind of situation. But also what... But through doing it after about a year, and not only that, but through the training that you get, you do realise that, you know, these, the parents also have been through trauma, trauma in their life. Mm -hmm. And they've been through, you know, some kind of abuse themselves. And this is the only way of life they know. So it's like a cycle, isn't it? Is it? A, yeah. It's very often lots of children that come in foster care, you know, it is always, a, most times it's the case, is that, you know, they've gone through abuse, their parents have gone through abuse, and that's the only way of life. Yeah, you know. no, absolutely. It's really, really sad. I wanted really to know, sad. I mean, with every, you know, experience, life experience that we have, you know, it teaches us something about ourselves. I mean, what has fostering taught you about yourself? I think it's taught you more about how resilient you are. Mm. Secondly, it's also taught you as a person, what kind of person are you? You know, you look at situations where these where the children come from. How are you as a person? How do you treat them? How can you make them better? You know, it, a lot of it does really make you look at yourself and see you as a person that you are. You know, everybody has this kind of a roman romanticized idea of oh, I'm really good, or, I'm really this, or really that. But when you look at it, you know, it really gives you open your eyes to what kind of person you are. Really does. It's absolutely true. My, uh, I was talking to a friend actually, and she was saying that her mother is a foster carer, um, and she said what what her mother actually gets out of it is is amazing. So mm. it's almost like a situation where you know, alhamdulillah, everybody benefits. It's yes. in, you know, and it's actually um, enriched her relationship with her mother as a result of this. Yeah. So you know, it's such a such a benef beneficial thing to do. Yes. Um, and I could talk to you about <laughs> this all day, but we have to move on so that we can get lots of discussion in about today's topic in her views where we will be talking about fostering in Islam. Fostering can be a lifeline for many children in the UK. The ability to be temporarily placed in a loving and stable home away from the possible turmoil they're going through is life changing. With many children coming from both UK families and abroad, it's clear as an Ummah we have a huge responsibility to these children. However, fostering can seem like an intimidating responsibility to take on, especially if we're combining an already hectic lifestyle with the needs of a child who clearly needs a lot of time and nurturing. Today we'll be looking at the plight of these children in need, as well as practical advice for those who wish to foster. Before we go on to the discussion, let's take a quick look at this clip. A home is a place of happiness, protection and comfort. It also provides a sense of identity. For children who are deprived of this, fostering is a temporary means to gain a home. Statistics show that over 62,000 children live with over 50,000 foster families across the UK, and this number is increasing daily. There are many reasons why children end up in foster care. Their parents may not be able to look after them, they may be unemployed so cannot afford the upkeep of their children. The child or children may be being abused by family members, or the child may have migrated alone from another country in search of a safer place to live. Due to the low number of Muslim families involved in fostering, many Muslim children in the care system end up living with families of non-Muslim background. 
Despite the good care these children receive in a non-Muslim home, the difference in culture can often confuse the child about their Islamic heritage. In Islam, the word kafala, the Arabic word to feed, is the equivalent to modern-day foster care and was prevalent at the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him. If this idea of fostering is not new to Islam, why then is there still a serious shortfall of Muslim families coming forward to provide a better life to a Muslim child? Well, some really emotional um, footage there in that clip. Yeah, I mean, what struck me is the fact that they said that 62,000 children are in care in this country. And I just thought, and one of the reasons why that they gave was probably financial reasons. And I just thought to myself, you know, why aren't these families getting the financial help rather than having, you know, to, to give their kids, uh, you know, to care, you know, I mean, Absolutely. why not make that facility available? Absolutely. It's definitely um, a huge problem, isn't it? Would, yeah. But to begin the discussion today, Sister Sarah, how, um, let's talk a little bit about the, these children. How do they actually end up in this situation? I mean, there's many, many reasons why children come into foster. I mean, um, neglect, neglect could be one reason. You get abused where it could be physical, sexual or emotional abuse. You also have things like um, maybe a child has a disability where the parents can't cope with the disability mm -hmm. and they have to put them through foster care. It could be a case where the parent have died. So they are essentially an orphan and they have got no other family members to take care of them. So therefore they come into fostering. It could be a case of the child being abandoned. Um, so yeah, there could be refugees, there could be trafficked into the UK for exploitation and then, you know, these children then come into fostering. But there are very, various numbers of reasons. Mm. It's not always about abuse, but it could be about, yeah. Yeah, but it could be. And so what about statistics? I mean, we heard some figures on the VT, but it seems like it's a, yeah. you know, it's a really huge Yeah, I mean, on issue. the NSPCC, they state that there's over 91,000 wow. foster children in, that's been taken care of by the state at present. Um, and that there's a shortfall of eight and a half thousand foster carers. So, yeah, I mean, oh, there is a real dire need for yeah. foster carers. Yeah, no, present, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. I mean, it could be said that Muslim children um, are, are overrepresented. Why does this problem exist, Asada? I think, you know, that argument is, is, is there. I mean, mm. as the sister said, 91,000 um, children in foster care um, in the UK. And uh, the, just a rough estimate of that is that about approximately 10,000 of them are from Muslim, Asian, black or ethnic minority backgrounds. And because Muslims make up around 2 to 3 percent of the UK, you know, clearly there is an overrepresentation representation of Muslims in care and I think you know some of the reasons that the sister gave are, are reasons that affect the Muslim community too we're not immune to these problems you know yeah. abuse whether it's emotional sexual abuse physical abuse all of these things they do affect the Muslim community yeah. Yeah. you know there's other issues such as drugs you know substance abuse those kind of things affect the Muslim community as well and you know I think also as the sister mentioned things like um, asylum seekers or refugees coming into this country often there's uh, you know if we look at uh, where where the majority of the issues are a lot of these countries that are having these issues are, are Muslim countries and so the kids coming from there yeah. are going to perhaps be coming on their own and so they will have to go into foster care unfortunately mm -hmm. so I don't think it's it's perhaps the case that it's just issues affecting the Muslim community I think that there are wider issues and the Muslim community is, is just going to fall under that category yeah. and be mm -hmm. you know affected by those things too yeah yes. absolutely certainly there's a huge story there with with all the different issues mm. that you've mentioned um, but, but what about the Muslim children that get placed with non-Muslim families, what, what happens to them? I mean, mashallah, their basic needs are, are, are looked after well. I mean, they're, they're, they've got their they're, they're fed, they're clothed, yeah. they're given shelter, they're given affection, they're given attention and all of these things. And you get even um, non-Muslim uh, uh, foster carers who, you know, Put the who put the effort in to try and teach the kids about their Muslim identity. So they might take them to mosques. They might, you know, read them um, Muslim children's books and all of these things because they don't want them to to miss out on these things. Yeah. But I think one of the things that we kind of might not realise is that or put too much um, uh, thought into is the fact that these kids need that Islamic identity that they can't get from a non-Muslim family because at the end of the day they need a practical example yeah. of what it is to be Muslim, how to live you know, uh, Islamically and the thing is that no matter how hard this foster parent tries they won't be able to give them that and there'll be questions that they can't answer you know uh, when it comes to these children the Muslim children so it's really important that um, Muslim families out there do get involved in, in, in becoming Absolutely. in fostering 
And, you know, the reality of the situation is that, as you mentioned, there are foster families out there that will do their utmost best to try and, you know, find out more about the um, identity and, and, you know, the religion. But there are also foster families that will find that very, very difficult and they won't know where to go for that information. Exactly. And so subsequently that is going to have an effect on the child, you know, whether you kind of, uh, if you just look at it, the reality of the situation is that, that the child will be affected by this. Yeah, no, that's absolutely true. Yeah, foster carers do a fantastic job. I mean, numbers of foster carers, I mean, they'll take them to Medusa, they'll feed them halal food, they'll celebrate the Eid festivals, you know, they do a fantastic job. But, um, and they have a lot of support as well, you know, outside support from professionals to make sure that, you know, these, their identities are met. However, yeah. even all the professionals agree, agree as well that kids excel in the areas which is where their cultural needs are met. So basically, you know, a Muslim child should be placed with a Muslim family, a Christian child should be placed with a Christian family. And this is, how, this is where they do it, so it makes a huge difference to their cultural upbringing. And Islam is a way of life. It's not yeah. just about going to Madrasa, but it's about your whole lifestyle, it's about your, you know, your personality and everything, all these things that what makes us Muslim. It's absolutely it, true, and obviously that's the ideal, isn't it? But yeah. there needs to be the Muslim people out there um, who volunteer yeah. as foster carers in order to um, accommodate that. Um, we actually, we have a caller on the line. Uh, we have a sister uh, calling from London. Salam alaikum, sister. What's your, what's your uh, comment or question? Uh, Salam alaikum, sister. I've got a few comments well. and questions. One is, could the sister tell us a couple of her, some of her highs, some of the experiences she's had looking after particular children? Obviously, she can't name them, but, you know, some of the kind of positive experiences or positive differences she's been able to make as a foster carer. And also, um, what's her view on fostering non-Muslim children by way of making a contribution to society? Yeah, really great question. Jazakallah, her sister. Um, so the, the sister's asking for some of the, uh, you know, the kind of highs, the good experiences that you've had with, um, with, with fostering. I mean, when you first get a foster child, you know, they can be very depressed, very morose, you know, kind of not enjoying life, you know, almost shielding away from life. Yeah. You know, very, very, you know, almost like closed in like a shell. And slowly over time, you can see that, you know, the whole personality coming out, you know, through the care and attention you give them, you know, you can see what the person is like. They excel in school, they do really well, you know, and they have that belief, the confidence come within themselves. Yeah. Through the right type of parenting and be able, just knowing that you are there to listen to them, yeah. you know, it can make a huge difference on how they feel mentally and, not just, and even physically, you know, they might have problems with eating and things like that and hygiene and all these things. And just by you just kind of encouraging that and to teach them, you know, that this is the way, you know, you should stay clean or this is what you need to do, it makes a huge impact on them. You know, they can have really good, make friends, they can be socially, you know, outgoing people and yeah. you know they could do really well in life got to you know university i mean my foster brother who lives with my parents is now in university oh, and wow. then, yeah you would you know he would when he first came you would you know it you was a complete different yeah, yeah. experience for him but alhamdulillah you know and this is what it is i mean i do foster also non um, Muslim children. Yeah, because that was the other thing yeah. that the sister um, raised. We actually discussed briefly uh, yeah. about this before the show, didn't we? And that's, this is really interesting. So tell us yeah, a little I bit don't about think, that. And the reason, you know, I think that all children need help and it doesn't Absolutely. matter whether they're Muslims or yeah. whichever, you know, they're all, you know, Allah's created creations and therefore it's our duty to take care of all children. Yeah. And I do believe that. And yeah, I mean, there is a slight difference, but you just have to adapt to it. You've of just course. got to learn to, you know, like compromise and make adaptions within your home yeah. to accommodate the children. That's all it is. Yeah, it's absolutely. not that difficult. And, the, you know, like I said, there's always professionals there to help you. I mean, you as a carer would have uh, your own social worker and the foster child would also have a social worker. But your social worker there is there to assist you, to, to support, support you, you. Yeah. to give you strategies, to give you, you know, ideas to where, you know, to how to get this child involved in life. Like so a whole support the, network there, which is, yeah. you know, it's really useful. Yeah. So you so. do get, uh, you know, really, as you said, a really strong support network, mm. a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of advice and, and the help mm. where it's needed. And I think a lot of the times this is something that people are so nervous about yeah. uh, when going into fostering because it's very much the unknown, isn't it? Yeah. Um, there so is a lot of training as well. I mean, a lot of training, yeah. yeah. And that really yeah. helps because if you can understand what's going on, why they are the way they are, yeah. why foster children are depressed, why they're, you know, going through these difficulties, if you can understand it, it's easy for you to then know how to Help deal them. with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely, so absolutely. Fantastic. I mean, what, what are some of the common misunderstandings about fostering? There's, I mean